Well, good evening, everyone. Great to see everyone tonight. Well, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Brandon Deal. I'm on staff here. I help out in the area of communications. Um, some of you may know my wife, Audrea Deal. We have three beautiful kids. Um, have been attending Harvest for approximately 17 years now. Um, matter of fact, I got saved over at the old building in Leo. Uh, so this is my first and last church that I've ever been a part of. Um, and speaking of first, this is the very first sermon that's I, that I've ever delivered. So um, <laughs> awesome privilege to be here tonight and getting into the word with you. And I, I can't think of a better group of people than, than you all who I consider to be my family. So one of my favorite stories from early on in my Christian walk was a time I got to play a trick on my wife. And I had just picked up this new iPod shuffle. It was the latest and greatest, super slim design. Um, the thing could hold like 1,000 songs in your pocket. Well, I'm in another room uh, loading this thing up with music and some teachings from Pastor Paul. And so I get them all loaded up. I fire up one of Paul's sermons. And I thought, hey, this thing is so slim, I could tuck it away in my back pocket and hide it behind my ear and, be, and pretend to be teaching and preaching to my wife. So I track her down in another room and walk up to her and just start reciting one of Pastor Paul's sermons with this intense authority, right, that only Paul does. Well, I don't remember what the message was, but I'll never forget the look on her face. She looked at me like I was her knight in shining armor. Now, don't take that the wrong way. She was probably thinking all the hard work that she had put into me is finally paying off. So now I would frame that as good temporary marital advice. If it wasn't for the fact that I have been letting her down ever since. And what I've come to realize is what she's wanted in a spouse is a godly man with unwavering faith whose actions line up with what they believe. Now, if our spouses need that from us and the people around us want that from us, how much more does the Lord want that from us? So on the topic of unwavering faith, we're going to be covering the book of James tonight. We're going to cover a holistic bird's eye view of chapters one through five. Now, what I love about the book of James is it's a very pragmatic, practical book of practical application, right? It kind of reads like the book of Proverbs, bite-sized nuggets of wisdom. Uh, so in a very few short chapters, James is going to unpack what the life of a mature believer should look like. So let's start with some historical context. Now, there's four different records of men named James in the Bible, but most believe it was Jesus' skeptical half-brother. Uh, we read that James remained unconvinced of the deity of Jesus Christ until after the resurrection when he first appeared to the 12 disciples. Now, it's humorous to me how James was known for being skeptical and then he does this 180 and goes all in on this book about unwavering faith. Well, most say it's but it was written 50 years after the death of Christ. At this time, Peter and other, others leave Jerusalem to go start other churches while James stays back in Jerusalem to lead this central church. So he writes to the 12 tribes of Messianic Jews from the 12 sons of Jacob. And we learn in chapter 1, he's addressing this letter to the church that's scattered across Israel as a re result of the persecution uh, from King Herod. So he's writing to believers who, have, who know the truth, have heard the truth. Uh, so it's, it's less of a doctrinal letter um, and more of a letter of practical application. He doesn't speak directly about Jesus' journey, the cross, or the resurrection, resurrection. Um, but we see that his teachings are largely influenced by the Sermon on the Mount and the book of Proverbs that was um, a, a really common book in homes in, in those days. 
So most summarize James as the book of genuine faith with key verses coming from chapter four. Faith without works is dead. James is saying, as mature followers of Christ, our faith should produce fruit that testifies of God's love. Now, like most scripture, when, when it comes to practical application, James is keeping the two greatest commandments top of mind, to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. But even though James doubles down on faith having works, he stands on the foundations of Christ to teach us some simple mechanics of an active working faith in our day-to-day -day walk. So let's start by taking a look, a look, an overview of these mechanics. An active working faith receives the implanted word. An active working faith draws near to God. An active working faith considers temptation as an opportunity to grow faith. An active working faith waits on God abides in God for the power to endure temptations, sees sin for what it is, seeks wisdom from above, humbly submits and resists pride, shows restraint, bridling the tongue, slowing to anger, and finally, loving your neighbor as yourself, as in showing mercy without favoritism or partiality, um, persevering in patience, compassion for one another, and taking responsibility for brothers and sisters. So let's dive into the word and start breaking down some of these mechanics. Number one, which I think is one of the most important verses in all of James, an active working faith receives the implanted word. Now that word receive means to accept. Accept God's word as truth. Move it from your head to your heart allowing it to work. Now we know faith comes from hearing. Even though James is coming in heavy handed on the subject of works, he's making it very clear where the source of faith comes from that produces the fruitful works out of us. And that's the changing, saving, healing power of the infallible word of God. Number two, an active working faith considers temptation as an opportunity to grow faith. James 1.2 says, count it joy when you fall into various trials or temptations, knowing, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Now that word count also means consider, examine closely. Observe well, look up toward, look again at with consistent reverential regard for what the Lord may have for you. Now we know joy doesn't mean the same thing as happiness. That joy comes from being in cooperation or being inside the authority of the Lord. It really has less to do with the trial and more about being inside the authority of the Lord. Other translations say pure joy. Now, it's definitely a purification process to begin seeing trials as spiritual growth opportunity. We don't have to like the trials, but the satisfaction comes from observing God in and through these trials. James 1.4 says, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect, lacking nothing. NIV says, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking anything. This exercising of our faith produces perseverance, steadfastness, endurance, and that is our, our ability to consistently wait upon the Lord. Now, I love Jude 21. It says, keep yourself inside the love of God. We're being tested each and every day. The Lord has opportunities for us to grow our faith each week if we want to grow. So A, either we're already positioned inside of God's love so that he can work, or B, 
He's going to allow trials and temptations to get us back to a place where he can work. Now, James says, when you fall into various trials or trials of many kinds, that's big or small. We know after the resurrection, the early church fell on many hard times of famine and persecution. Fast forward 2,000 years um, till now, we may not be dealing with famine and persecution, but the word of God is alive and powerful and relevant today. And many of you, I know, are dealing with some big trials. You've lost loved ones, you've lost children, you know, you're dealing with illness. Cancer has plagued this church just like everywhere else. Um, Studies show 40% of us in this room are going to deal with cancer um, in our lifetime. Uh, So there's no doubt, as you guys can all testify, uh, the Lord uses these big trials to stretch our faith in big ways. But what about the small trials? If you think about it, we have 365 days out of the year. If you take inventory of all the trials and temptations... A lot of these are going to be small, trivial trials that are tucked away, unseen, in the quietness of our own hearts. And many of those are going to involve other people. That's why the two greatest commandments are to love God and to love people. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I have a very special gift. And that is the gift of taking every small wind of a trial and making it a monumental, life-altering situation. Anyone else? I mean, kicking and screaming and acting like a giant man-child to the point where I'm making everyone else's life around me miserable. James is saying that's not the mark of a faithful person. And all throughout Scripture, we learn how the small things lead up to the big things. I like Luke 16.10. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. One who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. The reality is that the Lord has more opportunity for us in the day-to-day grind. That's opportunity to grow, opportunity to be a witness to others. If we can just get a grip on our faith, If we're constantly responding to all these little trials like like children, how can we expect to access what God has for us? How can we expect to be a witness in in in, in those big ways? Number three, an active work in faith sees sin for what it is, which is a separation from God by our own desires. James 1.13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted that I am tempted by God. God cannot be tempted, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Each is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desire and enticed. When desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. James wants us to understand the root of our sin on a very intricate level so that we're more equipped to combat it. The Bible uses pretty clear contrast to help us understand the full breadth of sin. The word says, if you have desires of hate in your heart, you're a murderer. If you have desires of lust in your heart, you are an adulterer. And James even reminds us that there's such a thing as spiritual adultery against God. We are to know that we are not fighting against flesh and blood but principalities and powers unseen. The Apostle Paul says the mind is a battlefield. He also says to bring your thoughts into captivity. The very concept that our thought life should be examined is a revelation that should change our lives. Number four, an active working faith abides in God for the source of power to endure. James 1.12 says, Blessed is a man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now, to endure, to endure is to abide in spirit 
and truth, to persevere, to hold fast to one's faith in Christ. We're not merely supposed to be biting down on a piece of leather and just getting by. The power to endure comes from Christ. And that's all about the ability to, to love God through these temptations. Number five, an active working faith seeks wisdom from above. James 1.5 says, if any of you lack wisdom, speaking about trials here, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. James doesn't say ask for deliverance through the trial that we face. He says ask for wisdom, and this is heavenly wisdom. This supreme intelligence that belongs to God and comes from the Lord. We should be asking to see every situation as God sees it for an understanding for how to respond according to God's will and purpose for us. James 3.13, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in meekness and wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are. James 3.17 says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield. Willing to yield. Full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I love it when people think I'm smarter than I really am. Man, that feels good, doesn't it? You know what else feels good? Being right. Even if there's a, a chance that I'm not in the right. But who has time to think about truth when your agenda's on the line? But isn't that what happens? We often are so blinded by our own agenda that we, we, that we make that our pursuit rather than God's peaceable plan for us. I think one of the most powerful marks of a genuine faith is someone who is okay with their perspective being changed. It's especially miraculous for mankind to confess that he is wrong, isn't it? I think that's a, it's a sheer miracle. There's some awesome lessons of leadership here. Uh, you know, to be a good leader, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room. You can be the least intelligent person in the room by 50 miles and still be an excellent leader under the authority of, of God. Number six, an active working faith resists pride, humbly submits, and draws near to God. James 4.1, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they come from your desire for pleasure, that war in your members? You lust and do not have. He's speaking of our desire to be king here. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you, you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures or your motives. Adulterers and adulteresses, speaking of spiritual adultery here, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? But he who gives more grace, therefore says, God resists the pride, but gives grace to the humble. 
The sin of pride is, is so deadly and sneaky, isn't it? I mean, the enemy is, is sure to, to put us in situations to entice us and, and um, entice those prideful desires that are, that are sort of innate in us. Now, uh, allow me to just air my, my wicked heart for a minute. I, I remember a, a story a couple years ago um, at work, uh, working on a project, and I was supposed to be leading the overall strategy, setting the trajectory of this project. So I put in a ton of hours um, putting this together, and I set up a meeting. And when I go to pitch the strategy to the team, some new person swoops in and delivers the same idea that I had. Now, was I secure enough in my own faith to be encouraging, uplifting, or maybe even excited that, that we were on the same page and, in, 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 you know, we're all in sync? Absolutely not. <laughs> Before I even knew what hit me, my heart, I found my heart spending the rest of the meeting trying to convince everybody else that that was my idea first. I mean, how gross, how gross is that? I left the meeting feeling so ashamed and, and convicted. Uh, my ugly sin was rearing. Uh, I certainly failed that test, but the Lord used it. I'm sharing it with you tonight, and the Lord returned me back to him. So, But that's exactly why James is saying we got to keep ourselves in check. He reminds us of several promises. James 4, 7 says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Humbly submit yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. All right, we've covered a lot of ground tonight. Can't cover all of James, but let's summarize this. If you look closely at what James is unpacking here, it's all about the sheer magnitude of faith. I want you to notice a few key words. Receive, accept, draw near, consider, wait, abide, seek, submit, and resist. Heed, return, my favorite, acknowledge. These are very simple acts of faith that, that doesn't require much. Now, although James is speaking about works here, he's not suggesting that we are to be striving on our own strength. James is saying that as a result of drawing near to our Lord and Savior, fruitfulness should flow out of us. That fruit that's produced is his. The power to change comes from him as we abide in him, the vine, the most important act of faith that we can make today, tomorrow, until we leave this planet is to simply acknowledge him in all of our ways. James is speaking about a kind of faith that stems from an active working relationship with Jesus Christ. Deeper, richer, closer, more intimate. In the still, in the small, in the quiet, a faith that's able to work in the deepest recesses of our heart And change us and grow us and allow us to be a true witness to those around us. A few years ago, my wife and I were in, in a pretty heated argument. Probably whether or not the socks needed folded. Now, it was one of those arguments where I'm at her throat, she's at my throat, the conversation is not going anywhere. My blood is boiling, and I'm about to puke out these words of hatred towards my beautiful bride, right? So I flee the house. I'm going to get into my car so that I can uh, cool down. Um, and something happened. I get in my car in all of my rage, and I just remember just this flash thought. I didn't say anything. It was a flash thought. My heart spoke to the Lord and I cried out and I said, what is happening? And I'll never forget how fast my emotions went from 100 to zero, um, quicker than I remember. And I didn't, re I didn't receive any specific instructions from the Lord. 
But the Lord just simply repositioned my heart. So I go back into the house. I get a piece of paper. I draw a line right down the middle of it. I said, OK, this is what I'm thinking is happening. This is what I'm hearing from you on this side here. If you pray about this, I'm going to pray about these things. Now, at face value, that's a pretty stupid story, emotionally charged, you know, but it doesn't make it any less true because I believe in the word of God. And I believe when it says the faith of a mustard seed has the power to move mountains. Now, nobody got healed that day and the Red Sea didn't get parted. But what I love about that experience was it was a very small Trivial matter, but it wasn't, it wasn't too big for God to show up and meet me there. And that small moment showed me that all it takes is a sliver of faith to make an impact. The small leading to the big. So let's close out with number seven. An active working faith takes responsibility for one another. Now, in key verses of chapter, one, chapter 2 and 5, James reminds us to love our brothers as ourselves, to not show partiality or judgment or favoritism. Uh, he says, God chose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom. Um, James says, if you're merciful, God will be merciful. Do not speak evil of one another. If anyone is sick and suffering... Pray if anyone is cheerful, sing and rejoice. But I love the way James closes out um, the book. 519, brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. The Lord has really done a number on my heart with this one. Uh, he doesn't say, give them your best advice. Give them the latest and greatest self-help book. He says, return your brother back to truth. The Lord has really just pressed it upon me to take a greater responsibility in the way that I am serving my brothers and sisters. So if you come to me with an issue, I hope I'm going to have compassion. But James is saying that the best thing that I can do is to encourage you to be reconciled to the Lord by pointing you back to the word of God, which is God. Now, what if that was our sole objective? To, to return each other back to the word of God. To do everything possible to get each other's eyes and ears in front of the gospel. To set up the one-on-one -on -one Bible study. To start the home group. To share our testimonies. To invite more people to church. You know, there's a lot of talk about revival right now. And I have to wonder, you know, what, what the Lord would do with this magnitude of faith. Now, as we go to pray, um, we can be given thanks, I think, just for all the pastors and elders at Harvest whose mission it is um, to keep us in the Word of God, um, to, to teach the Word of God um, the way that it's taught. You know, uh, it's very clear the Lord's doing some awesome thing, awesome things in this body of believers. And what a joy it's just been to, to witness all that is happening, the spiritual growth. I mean, people coming to Christ every weekend. Uh, what amazing, amazing thing it is. So, you know, I think, I think as we, um, we pray, we can pray the Lord keeps fanning those flames of faith um, and, uh, and, and just continue to do, do the work. Yes, Lord, we thank you so much for your worry. Thank you so much for your, your love and your mercy and your grace. We recognize you as our creator and our savior, Lord, and all you're doing here. And we understand love because you first loved us. And 
Lord, we just pray that your Holy Spirit will move and continue to work among us in this congregation, Lord, and um, just continue to fan the flames. Um, stir us, shake us, um, stir our affections for you, Lord. I just pray, Father, that you will um, just, just continue to be faithful. Um, go, go before us this week and be with us. In Jesus' name, amen.